Good morning. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Uh, uh, make sure you check out the um, soup cans I put together in a Google slide um, show for you. you. guys did a really good job with that. Thank you for those of you that have that turned in. Um, again, another reminder, if you have any missing work for third quarter, um, it can be made up through um, the Tuesday after spring break. So please take care of that if you um, if you have not done that already. Um, and today we're going to look at implied texture. So yesterday we looked at real texture and how you had you take pictures. Um, so implied texture is making something look like it has a texture, even though on a flat surface it does not. So you're giving someone the impression that it's there, even though it might just be a drawing. So what do artists use to create implied texture? And how do artists create realistic implied texture? So if you look at the example I have here, um, think through things that we've talked about in art already. So obviously, um, artists have to use line for um, implied texture. But then also, hopefully, you're thinking to yourself, well, they have to use value, lights and darks. Um, and those lines connect to form shapes. And so by looking carefully at what they see in front of them, not what they think it is, artists can make things look like it has different textures. So in this example, it looks like pieces of hair or um, material kind of woven together. So it's kind of almost like two implied textures. And the artist has to look really carefully at the lines that he or she seizes and the spacing and the lights and darks, the direction of the line to make it believable and look realistic. Okay, so artists use implied texture all the time. Um, so he, these are just two pencil drawings. Um, one is a little, little bit looser, but we can still tell the texture of the elephant's trunk, the lines or creases in it, but then also the texture of um, his actual skin. And then this is a close-up drawing of um, fur from a wolf. So the shorter hair kind of up by the neck and then it gets longer as it goes towards their body. So again, observing where those clumps of hair are, the direction of the lines, values, paying really close attention to that. So Albert Dürer was a German painter and printmaker and he um, lived during the um, early 1500s, late 1400s, early 1500s. And even though it was that long ago, he is still very well thought of, especially for implied texture. So you might have seen this example before. This is called the young hair, and this is a painting that he did. Very, very realistic, very adept at making it look like it is the actual fur of the, um, of the rabbit. And then this is one of his cell portraits when he was in his 20s. And so um, he is a very, very talented artist, even as a young man. If you have ever seen the Praying Hands print before, he is the artist for that. And there's a story about him and his brother um, and why he created the Praying Hands. So sometimes you um, may want to read that. And then um, this one, you um, some of the classes you might have seen me use this before. Um, he. At that time, people did not know what rhinoceroses were. Um, they weren't all over the place. There weren't zoos. There weren't um, even photographs. And so based on a description that somebody wrote after seeing a rhinoceros, this is what Elbrick Durer drew. So based off of that, so we think of how what an, an, a rhinoceros actually looks like and how it was described to him. This is what he thought the person was describing. So some parts are really accurate. Some are a little bit off. Um, but looking at this, all of the different implied textures that he created to make this look just engaging and realistic. So some parts are left without any shading or lines, make them seem shiny and smooth. Other parts are overlapped and layered so that they're casting a shadow underneath. But then also the lines look like they're curving around the surface to make it look believable and to create form like we talked about last week. So for today, you're gonna choose one of your photos from yesterday, just one of them. You can do more if you want, great. The more you draw, the better you get, but you need to do one. Um, and I want you to really look at it and look at the texture. Where are the lines? What direction are they? What value range lights and darks are there? Um, what will you need to do to represent or imply that that texture is on your paper? And you're gonna create what's called a thumbnail sketch of at least one of your textures from yesterday. So what direction and are the shapes and lines going? Will you need shading most of the time? Yes. Um, so you're gonna create a thumbnail drawing. Now what is a thumbnail drawing? So a thumbnail sketch is basically the size of our thumb. So it's a small sketch, not a large scale. Artists use thumbnail sketches all the time, sometimes for planning out their layout or their composition of their artwork, sometimes for just practicing a close-up of something, which is what we're gonna use. So this is not a very big sketch at all because I want you to pay attention to the detail and not have to do tons and tons of drawing. 
So one of my pictures yesterday was a basket that is sitting in my living room that has blankets in it. Um, and I started sketching out and I left part of this unfinished to kind of show you. I had to break this down. This is a lot of information to take in and I cropped my picture. So I just took one little section of my original picture and this original sketch is a roughly the size of my thumb, just my thumb. So it's just a square piece of paper. Here's my original. You can see it is about that big. So again, you're not having to draw very big. Um, I just want you to concentrate on the detail. So on the bottom, I left it plain. This was my, this is how I started it out. I followed the lines where they went in and out to kind of inner, in the interwoven parts of this um, texture of this basket. And then I went back and I started adding texture lines. Now notice these lines go in and out. Some of them disappear, get, they get lighter and darker. So my lines weren't all uniform. They weren't all exactly the same. And then I went through and I looked at where there were cast shadows. So I started adding some shading in and value changes to make it seem like it was believable. This is sticking out more, so it's casting a shadow on there. Um, just those little tiny observances really make a big difference. So this was a really fast sketch so I could get our video done and it's downloaded for um, our class. Um, I will upload a finished one, but I just wanted this on here as a reference to kind of talk about. So um, you're just doing one sketch today and those of you that are good drawers or that you like drawing and you wanna get better and you wanna do two of them, great. I just don't want it to be so much because I know you have other classwork to do as well. So for this assignment, you're gonna turn in, you're gonna create a pick collage just like yesterday. Um, so you're gonna show me what you were working from and then also your sketch. So we're doing it with a real and texture and an implied texture and then your name on the um, pick collage just helps me out um, when I'm grading and I can share some of these as well. All right, so pick collage gets saved to your camera roll just like before and turned into um, classroom. And I look forward to seeing you work. Have a great, great day.